Ooh, okay. <clears throat> um, now then, I'm going to uh, jump it around a little bit. If you remember way, way, way back, uh, we started looking at salt. Uh, in actual fact, uh, here we are on this one. Uh, oops. <clears throat> Try again. On this one, uh, we are. In fact, let's. Um, where is it? Uh, there we go. Right. Okay. So <clears throat> we're going to look at uh, uh, this machine here, uh, and uh, yeah, we've we've started messing around uh, with salt uh, states, which just to remind you. Uh, are <clears throat> it's going to be one of those days, isn't it? Uh, so, uh, salt. If we look at uh, testing for a. Okay, you can see there just a bit of YAML, <clears throat> uh, which generally speaking follows the form uh, uh, some unique identifier. Uh, then uh, <clears throat> the. Uh, module and function which you're going to run so the function is always within the module so in this case which this is checking for package installed now normally there would be a name uh, entry under it but because this is actually the name of the package um, it's uh, it will use that by default okay so this is asking us to install the package python 3 pip uh, and the advantage of using this PKG module <clears throat> is that it's uh, a virtual module, meaning that if you're running it on, you know, Red Hat, uh, you'll use a different installers to Debian or Ubuntu. Uh, if you're running it on uh, Windows, uh, it will try to use an installer on Windows. Although in this case it probably doesn't make much sense. Um, <clears throat> you, uh, if you're running it on a Mac, it'll try to use uh, uh, a Mac installation, assuming it's all being programmed that way. Okay, so the the the, the, the point being that package makes best efforts to uh, install whatever you've asked it to install. Now, obviously, it doesn't. You know, there isn't always a Python three pip package uh, so this would fail uh, on any system which did that but it would at least make a best effort now um, uh, down here we've got one which is uh, this time okay uh, what we're doing is uh, we're running pip uh, so the pip module uh, execute um, state module is being run uh, it has a function called installed which is basically doing a pip installed command uh, and again, because there's no name under here, it will try to install test impro, which is a pipi package. <clears throat> mm, uh, again, just to remind you, this require says uh, before you try to do this pip install of test infra, uh, I want you to make sure that you've already got the package. Uh, Python 3 pip and that basically is saying that we've done this module package module instruction has been executed for this target Python 3 pip okay so in other words we're just enforcing the order now the natural order within a state is typically from top to bottom so in this particular instance this won't make much difference unless and again we discussed this last time uh, there's a slight gotcha that it's possible that something else would invoke this uh, without necessarily including this and therefore this would ensure that that always happened first if you're what I mean so this enforces this require enforces the order uh, that would otherwise be left to uh, the natural order within a file which isn't necessarily going to be the way uh, Salk sees it that's Getting ahead of ourselves a bit, excuse me. Ooh. Okay, I thought today we would take a look at uh, formulas. So what is the difference between a state and a formula? Well, the answer is 
not much. Uh, a formula is simply uh, a complete bundle of state stanzas. So the, the, these are you know, the, the, the yeah. This is a stanza. Uh, this is a stanza. Okay. Uh, it's a load of states and state stanzas that are bundled together into one coherent uh, package. Uh, so we can see uh, an example of that. Let's uh, let's let's have a look at uh, swap stack. Um, ooh, uh, let's try. Uh, uh, I know a DHCP package. Uh, let's call it a DHCP formula. Okay, uh, and you'll find loads of these around the web. Um, but here's what here's one. Okay, so this is part of uh, the official st salt stack library of formula, and it is the DXCP daemon formula. Okay, uh, and so if you wanted to maintain uh, DXCP um, on your system, uh, <clears throat> then this formula. Uh, is sort of a ready-made kit uh, to uh, to manage it. Okay, so typically uh, you'll see this with the available states. Uh, so you can see you've got a DHCPD state and a DHCPD.conf state. Uh, so this one effectively does the package install and starts up the DHCP service, uh, and this one uh, does the actual configuration. Okay, and you will find generally the configuration is in pillars and you will find examples of what is an appropriate pillar okay so here is an example of what this formula is expecting you to provide in the pillar data mm -hmm. uh, for it to work now this one's particularly verbose you'll find that most of this will be optional or they're just giving you several examples uh, as a way of showing you different ways of doing things uh, and obviously in in a real environment uh, this pillar data is probably going to be broken up into many different files and spread around the place and will then be gathered together and given to a minion as part of setting up the DHCP service uh, so ooh, let's have a look at the formula itself excuse me I don't know why I'm holding it I'm showing you that time so this is the formula. Uh, now, generally speaking, you can forget most of it. Um, so, for example, the tests don't need to worry too much about unless you were developing this formula or particularly wanted to test it. This is where the formula will actually live, okay? Because this is the state file. Now, how do I know it's the state file? Well, uh, one thing that we haven't done so far, okay? If you look at the states we've got so far. They're all called uh, like you know firewall dot sls test infra dot sls. Okay, so the states are identified as firewall or test infra. Uh, so if I look in the top file here, uh, oops, uh, uh, then you'll find that they're just called test infra and firewall. Okay. And that works great, uh, other than when you've got more complicated structures. And in this case, we've got uh, a structure where we're making public uh, the DHCPD state and a DHCPD.config state, you'll notice. Okay, so we, what we could have done uh, is in here, okay, what we could have done is made a directory called test infra. Okay, and then instead of calling the state test infra, like that, okay, we could have called it init.sls and put it inside the test info directory. Okay, so now we've got the test info directory uh, here, okay, with the init sitting inside it. And the init.sls effectively is the default state file. So if I were to invoke the test info state, this is the, it would first look for a test infra.sls. If it didn't find that, it would look for a directory test infra, and within that, it would look for an init.sls. Okay, 
<clears throat> and that's exactly what this is doing over here. Okay, so within the DHCPD directory, uh, we've got the init.sls. So this, remember, is the DHCPD state itself. Okay, uh, and uh, this is not the state, that's a stanza within the state. Okay, uh, so all this is doing is making sure that the package has been correctly installed. Uh, this is a piece of ginger logic. Okay, so this whole thing is a piece of ginger logic, which is basically saying if somewhere in our configuration, okay, uh, and we'll, we'll get to this in a minute, it gets a bit complicated, but bear with me. Okay, so if within our DSCPD pillar, okay, we, the enable flag is defined. Uh, Right, so if it's defined and it's defined as being false, okay, then we do a service dead, which is basically uh, the salt package, uh, salt module rather, uh, and we can check that in uh, docs.salt stack. Uh, and if we go to uh, all salt modules, okay. And then if we go down to salt module, uh, it's actually salt state. Uh, so salt states, okay. What's the difference between the uh, state and the module? Uh, it's just where they're defined and executed, okay. So the states are the ones you always see in state in stanzas. Uh, the modules are execution modules. They're the bits of code that actually do the heavy lifting. Um, but we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that more later. So, okay, so here we were running the service state module. Okay, so if we go to states dot service, uh, here we go. Okay, and you can see uh, service dot running is one option, but service dead. And this is the one we're actually doing okay and what that does is it ensures that the name service is dead by stopping the service if necessary okay <clears throat> so because we've said DHCP enabled is false i.e it's not true uh, then we want to make sure that the service is dead okay so we make sure that the thing DHCPD.service which is another pillar value okay and this is a bit of ginger which makes sure that value gets put in as the name, which is whatever, DHCPD dash ICP or whatever, or ISP or whatever, um, ISC, whatever. We'll, we'll come to that in a minute because it varies from platform to platform uh, depending on uh, your uh, service manager, I guess, to a large extent. Uh, and we say enable these folks. Uh, <clears throat> enable being the thing which does the reboot survival and things like that however uh, if the thing is either if enable is not defined or uh, it is uh, true ah oh, De Morgan's theorem uh, then uh, then we ensure that the service is running so again we've got the same service name we enable it so it's true so upon reboot it will be restored and we've got two requires here which basically say first of all make sure that the server the server package is actually installed because otherwise how can you run the dhcp service uh, and make sure that the file dhcp config file is in place okay so these two states are going to be defined elsewhere okay they're not defined in here uh, right now up here uh, is where we get the DHCP, the config, uh, the values, which are mentioned down here. Uh, okay. And this is a fairly idiomatic way of doing it. Uh, we, we have a map ginger file, uh, which we read in, and we give it the name based on, uh, normally on the name of the package. Okay, so if we go back up here, you can see that the map ginger file is in here. 
Uh, and this is going to do all of the heavy lifting and getting our configuration and making sure that it's correctly set up. Now this stuff, okay, is the stuff that nightmares are made of until you actually see how it works. And all it's really doing here is merging a load of um, Python dictionaries, really. Uh, and all, all of this is about making sure that uh, all the fallback values for things like, uh, okay, some default values are supplied by uh, the operating system architecture, some are supplied by the family, uh, the operating, operating system family, uh, some uh, by other things, okay, and ultimately by the user who will define the, the sort of final value, if you like, um, which overrides any defaults. Uh, and that's really all, all, all of this file is all about make, managing that kind of um, set of fallbacks. So, you know, if I can't find it in my explicit configuration, can I find it in my operating system configuration of uh, various levels? Or can I find it in some ultimate default for the package? Uh, <clears throat> and that is really all this is doing. Uh, we don't need to get too much into the weeds on that. Uh, um, so that that is all about uh, all, all of these files are all just about configuring the um, default values. Now config.sls on the other hand, if you remember, okay, this is our other state, dhcpd.config. Okay. And the dot means instead of taking the default in SLS, we take config directly. And before you ask, yes, you can chain those dots as much as you like. They're effectively just looking at subdirectories. So we could have had a subdirectory within here to do something specific. We could have gone A dot B dot C dot, you know, we could have carried on nesting them. However, okay, so. Uh, here's something important. Uh, at this point, okay, if we invoke dhcpd.config, okay, that is going to include dhcpd, right? So the config is going to include the one we've just looked at, which really does the package installation and making sure the service is running. Okay, then uh, these stanzas. Uh, Basically, this one is going to create the configuration file, uh, and this one is going to create all of the stuff to do with the service. Uh, interestingly, if you go to uh, let's say, uh, yeah, let's go to OS map. Okay, so you can see here that the author of this has anticipated. Ubuntu, Raspbian, Fedora, CentOS, Amazon, Suzy, OpenSUSE, Fun2, Majora, Smart OS. Okay, uh, so th these are all the operating systems within certain families. Uh, and if we then go to OS Family Map, okay, so here you can see that for Debian, uh, we expect the DHCP D D config to be in slash etc. DHCP. Same for Red Hat. If you're on SUSE, it's just directly under etc. Uh, uh, on Gen2, it's under DXCP directory again. On Arch, it's the same as on SUSE. Uh, we've got nothing to say about Alpine and the various others. Uh, so here on FreeBSD, it's not under etc directly, it's under user local etc. So you can see this is how the configuration layers work okay is by making sure that um, the particular uh, operating system group or family uh, it will change the configuration so on debian the service and the server are both called isc dhcp server but on red hat even though the configuration file goes in the same place the server is called dhcp and the service is called dhcpd the demon version of it. Yeah. Uh, 
whereas the uh, DHCP daemon configuration is the same on Red Hat and Debian. Uh, they're different in terms of where the service configuration sits. So for uh, Debian, it sits under etc default ICP server. Uh, for Red Hat, it's under systemd, system DHCP D server. Right. Uh, so you can see uh, this is how uh, Salt knows about all the different variations uh, for these settings. Okay, and ultimately, uh, these this is the default value that are assumed if you've not overridden them in your pillar data. Okay, so again, the pillar data being DHCPD. Okay. Uh, what are what else we've we got under files we've got these will be the templates okay for the various configurations so for example the service on Debian uh, we've got uh, yeah it's just a load of um, uh, variable settings basically most of which are commented out the only one that really matters is what interfaces uh, Debian should, uh, sorry, the DHCP should attach to. If we're on Red Hat, then this is defining a system D uh, startup. In actual fact, that goes to show just how dated this is, I guess, because uh, most Debian now is system D based. In fact, you can see here uh, this was last updated some time ago. Uh, uh, having said that, Debian has been uh, it's been more than five months. Ah, anyway, and you can change this of course once you've once you've got it uh, in place. In fact, if we go to issues uh, or pull requests, maybe there you go. Uh, change Debian stretch. Uh, Uh, okay, that's a different thing. Uh, anyway, your mileage will vary on these formulas. Some, sometimes you'll find loads and loads of formulae to do the same thing. And it's a question of picking the one closest to what you're going to do. There is no sort of standardized uh, repository. Uh, anything in this salt stack formula is going to be reasonable as a starting point uh, but you you know you should you, you should experiment and sometimes you won't find one and you have to basically create from scratch uh, <clears throat> so you can see here uh, we've got some others uh, so you've got uh, yeah we've got one called salt stack formulas another another repository called salt formulas uh, so again, take your pick. Uh, we've got plenty. Okay, so here's a formula for Docker. Uh, and uh, this was updated on the 16th of March. And uh, right, so we can configure the host, we can configure the swarm, we can configure various client configurations. Okay, and again, it'll all be done through pillar. Uh, uh, okay, this one looks like it's a fairly sophisticated setup. The other thing to look for is who who is principally um, you know, managing it. Uh, the other interesting thing about this one is you see these underscores here. Uh, these will be new bits of Python code, okay? So this will be a bit of Python code that will gather data about the swarm. Uh, then you've got uh, a new module, uh, Docker ng service. Cool. Okay, so this is a new module um, which will be one of the execution modules we talked about. Uh, then you've got 
a new state module uh, for managing Docker NG. Okay, so this looks like a fairly a fairly thorough, thoroughly considered um, formula. Okay, so they're they're ready made kits if you like. Now, what about using formula? Right, to use a formula, um, what we need, what we generally going to do is uh, we're going to have a directory called formulas underneath this uh, SRV directory. So remember, we've got pillar for our pillar data, we've got salt for our salt data. Uh, test is something that I made up, which is for testing my infrastructure. Okay, but under here we will have a formula directory. Okay, uh, now you can do it singular or plural. Uh, now you'll notice that so far we've been using singular for everything. So okay, let's keep it consistent. So it's singular formula. Okay, and all you do is if you want to move, uh, use a formula, okay, uh, you just need to take this repository as it is usually uh, and clone it into your formulas directory. Sometimes there are exceptions, but that's generally what you need to do, okay? Uh, and in this case, I would guess that's exactly what you need to do. All of this stuff will take care of itself. Now, uh the other thing uh to consider is uh how you're going to maintain your formula personally i would never use uh the salt formulas repository directly i would always fork it into my own area and then i would use uh, i would clone my own controlled area why because otherwise you have to be very careful about when you update uh, your uh, cloned version in your formula directory because updating it uh, might pull changes from this upstream that you don't want. Uh, so it's much better, albeit with something of an overhead, to have your own fault repository uh, with this one as the as the upstream and then clone from that to your uh, SRV formulas directory uh, that way if an, an update occurs in the upstream repository you simply pull that into your uh, forked copy okay uh, and then take that forked copy and then you can pull that into your clone copy as and when you're ready and that gives you a buffer and much more control it also means that if this repository were to disappear for some reason uh, like for example uh, uh, if if uh, yeah if, if they suddenly decided to stop supporting this formula uh, and they decided to get rid of it and delete the repository and you're up the proverbial creek, okay, because uh, you don't have a copy of it anymore uh, other than in your formula area. Now, you can, of course, push that into your own copy, blah, blah, blah. But if you've got your own fault copy, you've got nice, nice stability, you don't need to mess about. And that becomes particularly important, uh, you know, when you're dealing with large, infra large complex infrastructures, you really want stability and Personally, having your own fault copy of all these formulae uh, in one place uh, is better. And to be honest, better even than having it on GitHub. If you do have it on GitHub, I would still maintain my own local repositories, uh, A, for performance reasons, particularly if you're working in the cloud. Um, it gives you a lot more control and it gives you uh, within the private network of your cloud. Uh, do all your work on that. And if you really want to maintain a public copy, then you maintain the public copy and you can push any changes back to your public copy through your normal CI CD you know, release process. 
Uh, again, it adds some complexity, which seems overkill when it's just a single man operation. And you're kind of like, oh man, do I really? You know, I'm going to have the original upstream. I'm going to have my fork on GitHub. Then I'm going to have my own local development repository, uh, you know, sitting on my internal network. And then I'm going to take that into my actual salt master. Uh, and the answer is, yeah, why not? Uh, most of your development work will be done on your local repository copy. Uh, in fact, let's uh, sketch let's this out because me mumbling about it oops, uh, is probably not helping much. Let's. Oh, you can Oh, I know. What a bastard I am for disturbing you. Uh, let's try and find a. Oh, here we go. Right. So, what am I talking about? So let's say we were going to do this um, salt formula for Docker, okay? So on GitHub, okay, we've got the salt stack uh, slash, what's it called? Uh, salt formula Docker, salt dash formula dash Docker that we want to use, okay? Which is great. Cool. Okay, fine. We're going to fork that. Okay, to our own. Let's call it the salty vagrant salt dash formula pocket. Okay. Now we could take that directly. Okay, and clone it into our salt master at srv slash formula slash uh, salt formula docker okay uh, and it will then be ready for us to use uh, and i'll talk about the final step of putting them into our configuration in a minute so that that's perfectly legit okay uh, and our work process there would be, um, you know, we'd have our developer environment over here, uh, and that would be also a clone copy. Okay, we would make any changes to it. We would then push those changes back to our SV salt formula. Okay, and then pull them uh, onto our salt master, and that would be our, our local loop, as it were. Okay. Uh, and if we wanted then to take those and give them back to the community, okay, we could do a pull request. Uh, pull, pull request. Oh, pull request back to here, and they could adopt them uh, if and when. Okay, so that is a perfectly legit life cycle. I'm suggesting, in actual fact, for most purposes. I would want to do one more step okay so instead of cloning from there what I would do is I would effectively fork although it's actually going to be a clone okay onto my local repository so local salt formula docker okay and this would be my local repository and then my developers Okay, would would work from there, and I would instead of cloning from my GitHub one, I would clone from, uh, I would clone from this local copy. Uh, yeah, at least now my terrible handwriting is in focus. All right, um, yeah. So I, I so instead of working from my from my GitHub. Okay, so all of this is in GitHub. Okay, and this is on in my local network. Okay, which I would assume would be uh, a close network uh, to my clone. So this would be within my control. Why this second? Well, yeah, why do this step here? Uh, the reason I would advocate doing this step here is because if GitHub goes tits up for any length of time 
uh, you are completely out of control of being able to update your formula. I mean, not strictly true, because in theory, you could do a bit of a Heath Robinson jobby and do your update directly like that. But, you know, if you've got a CICD chain set up that automatically does this step when you've got an approval that's gone in here, for example, uh, then uh, yeah, then your CICD chain will be broken and you will have to do some sort of Heath Robinson fix to get around it. Yeah. If, however, you're in total control of this bit, uh, this one over here, then it doesn't matter. GitHub can go tits up and you can, well, just don't care uh, because uh, all of your stuff is under your control. Yeah? Now, if this goes tits up, you've actually got control over it, so you 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 can actually get it back on its feet in the, in order to for your CI/CD chain to do its job, All right? Uh, so, an argument would say, well, yeah, but how often does GitHub go tits up? And the answer recently has been more often than we would like, and for longer than we would like. Um, yeah. Uh, no trust i don't trust third parties with stuff which is key to my infrastructure right. um so uh, yeah so with this second setup where we've got everything under our own control uh, and basically this is the boundary of our network okay so we've got our own local repository We've got our developers working on their machines and doing updates to our repository and our CI CD system taking it from here and cloning it and you know doing a pull to our sort master. Our sort master then being triggered to do deployments or whatever. Okay, very sexy. I mean that's what we're aiming for, is to automate everything downstream of wherever we approve changes. We don't want to ever touch a production system if we don't have to. And that's precisely what uh, you know we're aiming for uh, with having salt in here in the first place is that we are largely off off hands off of anything downstream of the last approval point which should be our repository uh, and as soon as it goes into the repository it gets out and gets updated now that is the ideal is to have this system in place uh, the reality mm, doesn't always work out quite that well and inevitably there are going to be machines out on our production system or on our test systems uh, that we're going to need some access to in order to troubleshoot or to fix emergency stuff um, you know the best systems in the world you're going to have to have that kind of access for a limited number of things um, but hey look we, we aim for perfection uh, high scratch marks will get you a lot of a long way there All right so uh, periodically uh, and I would again I would make this part of my uh, CICD that whenever anything was approved out to go out to the sort master I would also push it out to my github or at least queue it to be pushed out so that if github was offline uh, this queue would wait and would then push it as soon as it could so this uh, our version on GitHub, um, we could make it private or public, depending on how we valued this. Uh, or um, it just acts as a backup. So if it's private, uh, it just acts as a backup. Um, we don't really use it for anything. Uh, if we use it, um, if we're doing it uh, as a public repository, then other people rely on it. And when we push out, they, you know, they can treat it as their upstream. Uh, if something we think is uh, valuable to the general population, then we can always raise a PR and have that raised up to the, uh, the upstream, um, depending on how valuable we think the change is. Sometimes the changes will be tweaks that are relevant relative to only a very small subset of users. And you know the maintainers of the upstream may not want them uh, or may not value them the same way we do. Uh, other times they will be customizations specific to our infrastructure, uh, which we should avoid in formulae. You know, a, you know, a formula should really be general enough that it's not an issue. 
uh, for other people to use. If if you put something in a formula which is you know so customized that only your likes to use it, then maybe it shouldn't be in a formula. Uh, uh, that's kind of like a good yardstick, I think. Anyway, uh, right. So yeah, so I would advocate uh, generally. I would advocate never ever use the upstream as your source. So never clone from there to your salt master. Really bad idea because um, the only real control you've got is cherry picking from there to go into your master uh, or um, uh, you know taking all or nothing from there and if you take everything from there then you have to be very careful about doing a poll because as soon as you do a poll you're going to have an effect on your production system effectively uh, bad things can happen at least fork and then use the fork because then you give yourself a lot more stability about what you're accepting into this repository and that in turn uh, you know, uh, reflects what you're going to see over here uh, on your production system. Uh, ideally you don't rely on an external supplier for this thing at all. You bring it in-house to a local repository and then everything everything all your development and release work can be done on your CI/CD system on your own network but there is another reason for doing that by the way uh, and that relates to um, cloud uh, if you are working on cloud okay then there are costs associated with anything that goes across uh, from your internal network uh, cloud network outside uh, and this would therefore be an additional cost of transferring data between these two systems uh, or if you're doing this then between these two systems now with formulae that's not so much of an issue uh, if you're using the git file system then it's a bit more of an issue i mean in the grand scheme of things the costs are relatively small uh, you know because you're not so, you're not transferring gigabytes of data it all adds up, you know. After a few years, uh, the constant toing and froing uh, can 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 add up to a significant amount of data transfer if you're not careful. So, making it all within your own private network, generally speaking, uh, that will cost you nothing on a cloud provider um, if they're all within you know within your AWS instances. Uh, then, transferring data between AWS instances uh, within the same uh, uh, zone uh, certainly uh, should be zero cost um, it's only if you're going outside the zone or if you're going to the internet that you'll start incurring any kind of data transfer costs um, if you are constantly bringing up and taking down uh, you know uh, instances then th that would certainly start to incur a significant cost especially if you're putting stuff in your formula like the large data files that were going to be brought across uh, again not so sure i'd advocate that but even so okay so these are all things to be borne in mind when you're setting your system up uh, this setup where you've got this is kind of like the minimal setup where you've got your github being cloned down to here and we will probably use that setup uh, initially uh, when we're playing around with this uh, because uh, we have to be able to bootstrap up to the point where we can create our own local uh, repositories that we're happy with uh, so, so yeah uh, just something to think about right how are we doing um, yeah so that's salt formula now Getting your salt formula into so formula. Let's 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 do this. Uh, I, don't, I don't really want anything as fancy as that Docker formula at the moment. Uh, let's pick a a smaller formula. What have we got? Uh, keep alive, demon. Mm -hmm. Probably a bit too small. Um, Redis would be fairly small. Oh, let's encrypt because we're probably going to need that. Okay, so here's a here's a let's encrypt. Okay, we're not going to use it at the moment, but we probably will at some point. Uh, 
to set up our SSL certificates. Uh, whether we use this one or not is another matter, but okay, so, so if we were to clone this, okay, we can take this and we can do a straightforward git clone of that into this directory. Right? And we've now got it out, so there's a salt formula uh, uh, and okay, so you can see here there's a whole load of stuff in here. Um, uh, uh, Actually, let's, let's do three from this level. Uh, so you can see we've got our salt formula, and this is our let's encrypt state uh, with various bits and bobs in it. Okay, so you've got a let's encrypt client state, uh, a let's encrypt files area, and a let's encrypt state. Okay, so you've got two states here. Uh, let's encrypt in SLS. That tells us that let's encrypt is a state and because we've got another in it here we know that let's encrypt dot client is also a state okay uh, and then the rest of this stuff okay we've got tests uh, uh, to be run and no doubt some documentation to tell us what's what uh, so here we go uh, the package uh, this is about installation, three installation methods. Uh, then you've got usage. So this will be our pillar data, okay, which says everything we need to know about setting up to get our Let's Encrypt certificates. Uh, yeah, anyway, I'm not too worried about the details. Now, the point is, if I go to uh, here, uh, okay, so I'm now back in my salt state, and I want to add Let's Encrypt, all right? So let's do an I top there, so let's dash, and we're going to do Let's Encrypt, okay? So that's the name, uh, that's the name of our state. Okay, that's that's this thing here. Uh, okay, that's the name of our state, and that should run this init file. But there's a problem, and that problem is that this won't work. <laughs> okay, if I do um, salt, uh, actually, just before I do this, let me just confirm. Yeah, so it's all set up on server one. Okay, so if I do salt SRVs, here's our one uh, state dot high state, <coughs> and if I just run test equals true. Okay, so you can see here no matching SLS found for Let's Encrypt. But wait a minute, I thought I just added the formula. Well, yeah, you did. Uh, the problem is. that you need to add to your configuration uh, instructions on where uh, the salt master can find your formula uh, states okay uh, and that requires that you um, where are you? Salt stack formula uh, there we go. Salt it's worth saying that salt stack are making efforts to standardize the structure of uh, and packaging of formulas uh, we'll probably have a look at that later uh, okay so um, we'll, we'll deal with git file systems a bit later okay uh, this is what we're doing at the moment okay we're, we've we've made our serve formula form, we've said formula they've said formulas um, uh, it doesn't matter because as you can see uh, we followed our instructions up to this point we cloned it in here okay but now uh, at the moment our in our um, in our master uh, if we go to 
Um, and guys, so if we look in here uh, and go to uh, Uh, of course, there's nothing in there at the moment, but I don't think. I think it just relies on. Yeah, it's just relying on the on the default at the moment. Okay, so this is the default. These three lines here. Now, a word about this. Um, I'm not a massive fan of uh, editing this file, uh, the the master configuration file. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a much bigger proponent of editing the um, uh, uh, master.td of creating uh, files in here, master.d, which will get loaded as part of the configuration. Uh, the reason being that I can then name them according to what they are. So let's say this one's going to be for the file system. Uh, okay, and if I, uh, uh, oops, didn't mean to do that. Uh, right, so if I take these three lines here, okay, oh, sorry, my fingers are assuming that I'm not zoomed in. Oops. Uh, right. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay, so these three lines here, uh, and of course it didn't bring across the one because that would have been too easy. Uh, okay, so you've got file root base and then. So this is the default setup, uh, which is going to look in that serve salt directory for any states. So if I mention the state X, it's going to create slash serve slash salt slash X dot SSL, uh, SLS. If it doesn't find it there, it will construct slash serve slash salt slash X slash init dot SLS and try and find it there. If it doesn't find it there, then it will fail, and that's exactly what's happened so far. Right now, to add our let's encrypt, we need to add slur serve formula. Uh, now we can't stop there. Uh, we can't stop there because if we stop there, it will try to construct slash serve slash formula slash let's encrypt, which we know is not right. Okay. Uh, if I go uh, if I go back to formula, if it constructed slash serve slash formula slash let's encrypt, you can see it wouldn't find it because we've got this salt formula there. Okay, what we need to do is put slash salt dash uh, formula uh, formula dash let's encrypt uh, okay so now the search will start with slash serve slash salt slash let's encrypt dot sls won't find it slash serve slash salt slash let's encrypt slash init dot sls won't find it hasn't found it in any of those so it will then go to slash serve slash formula slash salt formula let's encrypt slash let's encrypt dot sls it won't find it it will then look slash serve slash formula slash salt formula let's encrypt slash let's encrypt slash init dot sls hey it finds it Okay, and that's how this file root works. Okay, so if I now write that out, uh, and we don't need that anymore, and we're done with that. Now, uh, the salt uh, master will only read that configuration when we restart it. So, uh, systemctr restart salt master. 
desktop. And now, hopefully, when I try to do this high state, And ah, okay, the menu not returning because, in all probability, uh, it hasn't reconnected yet due to our restarting the master. And life's too short to type that number in. Okay, let's try again. Ah, oh, well, that could have worked out better, couldn't it? Uh, oh, maybe I should have loaded any configuration. Uh, okay, let's go back to uh, configuring the salt master. Mm, I thought we just mm, I don't think we had to tell it mm. yeah star dot com yeah uh, so what? What gives, man? System dot com. File underscore three. That is the right one, isn't it? Oh, loops. <sighs> Always one fucking letter, isn't it? Uh, makes sense. Right. Okay. Oh, no, that still won't work. Because uh, I've got to do that. That was what I intended to do. Uh, I missed by one. Up movement. Okay, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. I'm probably going to get a minion did not return if I do it too soon. Uh, so we'll leave it a few seconds after it comes back from doing this restart to give it an opportunity to reconnect. And let's give it a go. Uh, oh, look. Uh, cool. Okay, so we're at least getting an error now, which is consistent. Uh, and the reason it's giving us this error is because uh, I've obviously been screwing around with something in the firewall state, uh, which uh, is wrong. However, if I do uh, let's encrypt, I mean, th this isn't going to work because we've not set up any pillar data for it. There you go. Uh, the point the point is that the state is there now 
uh, because of what I said, the, the, all the falter. Now, you can see, adding a formula is a bit of a three-act drama because you have to change the salt master configuration and then do a restart, which is one of the reasons I advocate keeping everything in that separate file because you could, in theory, uh, you could have the salt master update its own configuration and do the restart. Right. Uh, hopefully, adding new formulae is not something you're going to do every day, uh, but uh, it's you know it's possible it's something you need to do. Now, there is something else. Here we go. The Git file system. Uh, I'm not. I've got to say, I'm not a huge fan of the Git file system. I'll explain why in a second. The idea behind the Git file system is you specify these remotes, okay? And you can specify formulae as remotes, okay? Again, uh, whenever you add a remote Git file system, you're going to have to add it to the master configuration and then restart uh, the uh, salt master. So, you, you know, you're still, you've still got to restart the salt master using the Git file system. Uh, the idea behind the Git file system is that every, uh, I think by default, every 60 seconds, the system will poll any remote repository mentioned in the Git file system. And if it sees a change, it will automatically pull that change onto the salt master uh, and cache it on the salt master. In other words, it maintains a working copy on the salt master. Uh, which is all fine and dandy uh, uh, so the next time you run your salt master states it will pick up whatever is in the cache uh, which is great uh, but strikes me as a little bit pointless if you've got a proper CICD system set up if you are uh, doing uh, if you've already got a pipeline set up where your build system uh, is verifying that everything is pucker for this new formula or new state to be deployed to the salt master, then surely uh, you just have your build system do the git pull onto the salt master. I mean, God, you could even have salt do it itself uh, as, as part of that step. Um, you could have the minion, if, assuming you've got a minion running on your salt master, which, yeah, why wouldn't you? Um, you know, you could have it update the slash serve slash salt area or slash serve slash formula area, whatever. Um, you know, as part of that process. Uh, so the git file system seems a little bit redundant. Uh, and the, the overhead is that you've got it constantly polling. So if you've got 20 or 30 formulas, uh, uh, or you've added in Git file system remotes for substantial sections of your uh, salt state, um, you know, slash serve slash salt, uh, then you, you know, you're going to be constantly hitting these repositories. And if those repositories are external, uh, see our earlier conversation, um, you know, that, that traffic all adds up uh, and it's an overhead. Uh, on your network and on your system. Uh, sure, it's a small overhead, it's a trivial thing. Um, but what, why, why bother? Why, you know, I don't get it. It's there if you want to use it. Um, I'm, I'm not a huge fan. Uh, I, I think there are better ways of doing this without having all the problems associated with the Git file system. Uh, not least of which is, you know, which which interface, uh, which uh, interface Git, Git library do I use to do the do the fetches? Um, you know, the overhead on your salt master of doing it every sixty seconds. Why do it every sixty? You know, why why do that update? I mean, yes, you can change that time to once every five minutes or whatever. But why do that uh, when the only important operation to update your salt state, uh, whether it's be the state itself or, or the formulae uh, should all be triggered as part of your you know, CICD workflow anyway. 
I guess if you don't have that workflow, uh, in which case, why not? You know, what are you are you allowing your uh, yeah allowing your production thought master to be hostage to fortune? Whatever's put in you know, the associated Git file system repositories is what's going to end up on your thought master. Uh, which seems horrible. So uh, yeah, unless you're pulling something which is uh, a known quantity, uh, yeah, you shouldn't you, you shouldn't be pulling it. Uh, and if it's a known quantity under your control, then you should be doing a CD. If it's not under your control, then what the hell are you doing? You know, pulling it straight from the repository. You should be forking it, and giving yourself breathing space so that you can control that process and then have your CICD pull it from your forked repository, you know, your, your, your controlled repository, as part of your release process, as part of your update process. Uh, it just doesn't seem to make sense. I mean, it's one of those things that kind of looks cool uh, when you first look at it, a, a, a few minutes thought, and you're kind of thinking, well, where's the advantage? Uh, you know, this is something better done elsewhere. And if you're thinking, well, okay, but what, what about other stuff? Uh, you know, what about my pillar data and stuff like that? Well, again, uh, you know, why would you not control that more closely? In fact, we'll see we can put pillar data into some interesting places uh, that are not even, you know, files on top master uh, and are probably better, therefore. I don't know. It just seems odd, but uh, it's there if you want it. Anyway, that is salt masters. I, 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 there was a question on the mailing system about about the Git file system, um, and somebody had got themselves in a, a very confused state where they thought that the Git file system allowed them to. Put, it seemed that they thought they could push from the master back into. You know, the Git file system uh, from the, the master. And no, well, I mean, you can, but dear God, why would you? Because uh, you know, that would mean you're actually editing on your salt master, which is ultimately uh, not something you want to be doing. Right. Uh, now then, there are other things we can do. Uh, for example, um, if it's part of your CI CD process, then you can automate things like maintain the files uh, file roots entry in your mass salt master uh, and every time that file changes uh, you can kick the salt master to restart itself for example as part of your CICD process um, yeah, oh man there are so many cool things you can do uh, why the hell would you use the git file system anyway Right, so that's formulate. Now, uh, let's just very briefly look at formulate packaging. Um, this is something that I've not really played with myself very much, uh, mainly because it's not 100% mature yet. And uh, uh, I don't know whether that's it actually. Uh, Uh, no, that's not what I was looking for. Uh, here we go. SPM packages. Uh, this is this is where we really ought to be trying to head. Uh, the idea that things get wrapped up into standardised package formats. And you'll notice that some of those package formats that we'd already looked at were beginning to follow uh, this kind of structure. Uh, but this is uh, the kind of uh, more formalized way of, of, of doing it. Uh, what it really does is it, it bridges between uh, 
the construction of the formula and distribution from like GitHub or you know from a repository straight into slash serve slash formula and gives a little bit more control in or, or a little bit more uh, uh, packaging. Uh, uh, so it can do a few more checks. Uh, yeah, uh, like I said, I've, I've not used it. I'm, I might have a crack at one of these just to see. So you can see that the basic steps are: you assemble the formula files in the build system. Well, okay, that's a standard formula. Uh, you create a formula file and place it at the root of the package folder. So this is not dissimilar to uh, like a, a manifest file or something like that. If you were doing a gem or, or you know a gem file in gem or something like that, it's probably the similar sort of thing. Then you run the SPM build. Uh, and that then gives you an SPM file, which is probably some kind of zipped up folder, you know, really. Uh, uh, and then and then you put it onto the repo system. Is that something that's read? Uh, it can maybe distribute the salt masses over, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, okay. Uh, actually, any system, and you install salt, salt, you install so you can run a repo command, and you can update and add packages to the repo. Do not require the salt masters running on the system. Okay. Uh, I mean, what would be really good is if there would, if this meant you could add stuff to your build without the need uh, to restart the ma master every time. Okay, so what have we got? Uh, formulae, that, uh, that, so that's a package just like normal. Uh, Oh, that's a bit scary. Okay, uh, reactors. We'll talk about reactors much later. The reactor, very briefly. Uh, the reactor system allows you to uh, take actions based on things that happen in your infrastructure. So you can have monitors running. Uh, on each of your minion systems uh, and they can be sending events because remember uh, salt is basically a big event bus anyway uh, so you can send an event back to the salt master and have the salt master take some action and that's what the reactor does the reactor is the thing that looks for those events and then responds to those events often by running a state yeah, a good example of a reactor would be a bit like a uh, sort of tripwire. Uh, so you can have a reactor look at a configuration file and say, look, if this configuration file is changed, uh, then I want you to tell the salt master, and the salt master will then run the state to restore that back to what it should be according to uh, according to the salt configuration. That's, a, that's a, a kind of very simple use of the reactor. Uh, so if somebody were to log on to that machine and attempt to change that file, uh, the reactor would immediately notice that and we then tell the salt master, uh, this file has been changed and I want you, and then the salt master would say to the minion, put it back like this, because that's what it should look like. Uh, the caveat to that, of course, being uh, you need to be careful when setting up that kind of thing that you don't create a problem where uh, you know, you tell a minion to update that configuration file, and then the reactor tells the salt master uh, this file's changed. And then the salt master tells the minion change that file and changes it, and, the, and you can end up bouncing back and forth. So you have to be a bit careful to make sure that you suspend the reactor response uh, when you do a legitimate update. But we'll, we'll talk all about all of that when we set this kind of stuff up. It's debatable whether that's actually a good use of reactor, uh, but it's a simple example. Okay, it, it, it's the idea that a minion can tell the re, tell the salt master this thing has happened, 
And then the salt master can respond by running one, two, three, multiple states. It could raise an alarm. You know, it could say, um, you know, this file has been modified. Uh, here's a list of all the users that were logged onto the machine at the time. Uh, so, you know, you've got an auditable event. Uh, it could be that it would um, uh, uh, shut the machine down. It could take that machine out of a pool. You know, there's lots of things that the reactor could do. Uh, uh, and then comp, these files are types of configuration for salt, blah, 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 yeah, whatever. Uh, so, okay, so there's three types of packets now then. Packets, built. Oh, bz2, there you go, uh, tables. Uh, uh, having a package database is kind of nice. Um, now, SPM specific loader modules, here we go. So, uh, uh, package manager, yeah. Uh, Okay, so you've got a package database, which fine. Uh, okay. Well, that's fine. So it installs them locally into blah, 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 but does it... Does that imply so, okay, so this is setting up a repository so far, so cool. Installing now, uh, they're installed on the salt master, good, where they're available to salt minions, whatever. Uh, configuring remote repositories. Okay. Updating local repository metadata. Fine. Update file routes. Now, SPM packages are installed into the blah blah salt folder. Okay. Okay, so we're getting somewhere now. This is actually good stuff. So once you've added the SPM salt, you don't need to change it again. Uh, SPM does not check to see if the files are already in place. Okay. Okay. Okay, that's good. Uh, okay, we might we might have a crack at this. What it means is that that. Uh, this solves the problem of constantly having to update the um, uh, update the configuration uh, because you can run this SPM install uh, so you can maintain your own local repository. If I've understood this correctly, and I, I have because I'm a genius. <laughs> okay, so uh, so basically. Um, this this actually is pretty cool. Um, it introduces a little bit of an overhead. God, oh, this is when I was doing all my network stuff. Okay, so okay, so now uh, just by way of illustration, uh, we've got our GitHub repository, which contains our formulae. So let's say that was our original. Let's say that was the DHCP one we were talking about earlier. Okay, so we will fork that to our salty vagrant version of the DHCP daemon. Right. Uh, we would then uh, add to that, yeah, assuming it didn't have it, uh, the formula. Actually, I've got a feeling that did have it. Let's just have a look. Uh, uh, salt formula, here we go. Uh, no, that was the Let's Encrypt one, which certainly didn't have it, I don't think. Uh, no, it didn't. Uh, and I've got a horrible feeling that it was the other one, wasn't it? Mm. Uh, that's the ISC DHCP, that's not 
the one we were looking at. Uh, okay, let's do that search again. What was it? Salt stack DHCP. There we go. I think this is the one we were looking at. Yeah, it already has a formula folder. So this, uh, this one is all ready to be packaged uh, using the SPM. Cool. Okay, so we can take that. Okay, we don't need to add the formula folder because it's already there. Okay, so we can do the SPM build and put that into our own local repo. Yeah. So now it's in here as an SPM file. Yeah. And on our salt master, uh, we create the SPM salt uh, down here, add it to our file, file root. And that's the only thing we need to add. If we now want to use that uh, DHCP salt folder, all we do is do an SPM install uh, DHCP D formula, uh, I think. Okay, which would it, which would install the package from the repo. Okay, that's kind of cool. And the point being that having done that, we don't then need to do the reboot. Okay, we can use it directly because it would be added under here as slash DHCPD. Okay, and the reason I know that is because if you look at the formula file, that's what it does. It says this formula is called DHCPD. Tells you which operating systems it supports, which operating system families it supports, what its version is. Okay, so all of this stuff could be produced uh, as part of your CICD. I'm loving this. We are, we are definitely setting this up. Yeah. Yeah. What kind of monkey would do it any other way? Okay, and this gives us another reason for setting up our own uh system uh yeah this one's also a formula i've got a feeling these salt stack formulas might might, might be the more official yeah because all of them have got this formula in them yeah uh, and that's the giveaway that they will be so i love this okay that's a much better way of doing it yeah so when we set our system up we are going to set it up this way uh, uh, we're actually, uh, actually, we're going to be slightly more complicated because um, I'm, going to, I'm going to add the, the one extra level of complexity. Uh, no, it's not complexity. Uh, for all the reasons that I explained earlier, uh, I, I like to have everything uh, sort of in one place if I can. Right, so we're going to have, let's say, you know, uh, we're going to use this Nginx formula. So on GitHub, mm. let's do it in black because GitHub is evil. No, I'm, I'm joking. Okay, so on GitHub, right, uh, we're going to have salt stack uh, formulas. Slash engine exporter. Right now, assuming uh, that I want to uh, give back to the community any changes I make, uh, I would fork that into my own copy. Okay, uh, and that would make creating pull requests back easy enough all right so any changes i made would go onto this one and then pull requests back to there but i don't want to use this repository as my uh development repository repository necessarily uh, because uh, i then have a, a basic reliance on 
uh, you know, get up. Uh, and again, this is a this is a, a personal choice, right? Uh, I prefer to have on my uh, environment. Yeah, I'm going to have my my repos. Yeah, let's go on my Git repos. Okay, it doesn't matter. It, it, we might have our own local instance of GitLab. We might have our own system, custom made system. Yeah, you know, we, we we it doesn't matter. The point is that what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a copy of this. And that will be where I work uh, for the most part, right? And my development team, okay, so dev1, uh, dev2, and so on, okay, are all going to work on this repository, right? And they're going to do all of their work on here, and they're going to figure out all the problems, blah, 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 blah. And then once we're happy that everything is okay, our CICD system will say, yeah, this thing is pucker, okay? And it will build it, SPM build, in a package, and we'll put it into my uh, SPM repo as a, uh, a new version, right? And everybody will be going, yay! Okay, so now I've got my Nginx in here, right? And again, my CICD system would say there's a new Nginx package available uh, and I would assume that at that stage we would have uh, potentially some sort of gate. Uh, the reason being that this might go in association with other changes, then there, there may be a reason why we've updated that package for some other reason, or it could be uh, you know that we're saving uh, environment and, and uh, now, architectural changes are going to be saved until you know a Monday morning or whatever, uh, rather than doing it at five o'clock on a Friday when everybody's buggering off for the weekend. So there may be some sort of gating, but ultimately we do uh, our SPM install onto our salt master, and it then becomes available, and then potentially. Uh, we have, uh, you know, we're going to execute our salt state update to then push that out to all our minions. All right, so we've now got several steps in our chain. The point being that everything from this point uh, is fully automated onto our infrastructure. Now, everything up to this point is automated by our CI, our CI pipeline. Yeah. Uh, this would be our CI, this would be our CD side of things. Yeah. So CI side of things would be this. Uh, and if we wanted to push back up here to make it publicly available, or or we wanted to uh, potentially give it back to the uh, to the uh, community, then we would do it at this point. So when the when the build is successful, we would say yes, this change has been successful. Uh, you know, we've done our tests for X, Y, Z. I mean, potentially, we might actually say, well, okay, it's got to go out to our test environment. Okay, and if it passes our test environment, then we will trigger the push back to the upstream forked copy okay uh, and then uh, i guess uh, yeah th that would then require some human intervention to create a pr for it to be propagated to the upstream uh the, the originating thing uh, but you know uh, pr requests uh, there, there probably is a github api for doing prs but yeah, yeah, that's something you'd have to think about whether it was worth doing. Uh, it could, it could be you say, well, okay, the cost of automating this step is too high, uh, given the number of times we're going to do it. Uh, yeah, compared to the amount of churn down here, 
is, is so infrequent, we'll just leave it manual. It's not worth investing in automating it, uh, particularly if there are stringent requirements on uh, the form that the PR should take. Uh, it, then definitely it's not worth automating because they could change. You know, the people over here could say, oh, well, you know, we want to change the way our PRs are structured or the, you've got to provide different information or whatever. Um, uh, and that would certainly be different from project to project. Uh, so it's probably not worth updating, uh, uh, worth not trying, it's not worth trying to automate this step for that reason. Uh, but it's certainly worth automating everything on this side of the page. Um, certainly you can push back to your own copy uh, to make it available. Um, and all of this should be automated. I mean, that's the whole point about doing this stuff. So the additional cost uh, is if this upstream uh, isn't properly structured, uh, then you're going to need to, uh, when you fork it, you're going to need to restructure it and get it ready, uh, potentially. Or you say, well, no, I'm not going to do that. Uh, although being a good citizen of the open source network, uh, open source world, I guess that's what you should do. Because then if people come here and go, uh, you know, I don't want to use that because it's not ready to be SPM deployed, uh, but they could find yours. And go, oh, this one is ready to be SPM deployed. I'll, I'll use this one instead. Okay. Uh, failing that, you would you you would say no. We'll keep that and that basically the same. Uh, and in here, we would always get this ready to be uh, SPM deployed by writing the formula file and structuring it if necessary, so that all of our downstream stuff would work from the SPM repo. Okay. Uh, which would make everything downstream a lot more effective. Which then raises the question, uh, this whole pipeline then raises the question, uh, what, why the hell would you ever have anything which wasn't a formula uh, on your sort master in, in terms of states? Now, why would you ever have S, uh, uh, SLV salt uh, directory? Uh, you know, and the answer is there are a lot of little bits and pieces uh, on your infrastructure which probably don't warrant a formula in their own right. Uh, and all of those little bits and pieces uh, are exactly what goes into SRV salt. Um, yeah, there's a lot. Uh, there's a lot of little bookkeeping bits and bobs that you probably want in SRV salt. Uh, but whenever you are doing something fairly standardized, uh, if you haven't got it in a formula, then what you should do is review your salt states uh, uh, periodically and actually have a process of saying, no, this is now big enough and complicated enough. That it should be a formula in its own right. It is self-contained and we can write a formula, in which case you develop your own formula so that it can then go through the SPM system uh, out to uh, your salt master uh, and then if your uh, formula is generic enough give back to the community by pushing it up and uh, letting people use it as uh, that formula uh, you know, SPM packaged formula hmm. uh, the other thing to bear in mind is if you go down this route of, of you know, this whole uh, you know, this, this, this whole life cycle um, you've got an additional thing where uh, the SPM install uh, will also separate out the pillar data uh, as uh, an example uh, and, and write it into your pillar data uh, to which I say caveat emptor uh, because that although that provides the, the defaults and will mean <clears throat> that your salt formula will basically work. Um, it might cause issues. Uh, oh, we'll look at that when we get to it. Oh, I'm very excited by that. I like it. Yeah. Anyway, on that note, my dog has just farted. And it's very smelly. Kenny, how do you do that? Hmm? It's dinner time, isn't it, mate? So let's get you sorted. Uh, right, yes, I'm very excited about that. 
Uh, right, so we're, we're close to actually doing stuff now. <laughs> uh, right, so uh, we need to, uh, we, we really need to start setting up our firewall. Uh, and then we need to start figuring out which uh, formula we're going to use to construct any of that. Is there an NF table salt stack formula over here? Uh, I mean, there's a, there's a lot of stuff. Let's encrypt. We will certainly use uh, sudo as we might use. Docker will probably end up using uh, open SSH. No, um, because we're going to use a different VPN system. Uh, this uh, we're going to have to we're going to have to review the Docker formula. Uh, Reverse grains, oh, that's an interesting idea. Uh, let's encrypt certainly. Uh, yeah, salt, salt itself. Yeah, we'll probably give that a miss because we're going to do it all other ways. Uh, Packer. Uh, I don't know why I'm searching through this because. Uh, we can probably just do you know, find a repository. Right, what was it? We are going to need DHCP at some point. We're going to need bind nine at some point. Bind at some point. Let's have a bind. Yeah, there's a bind formula. And if I look, uh, yeah, it's properly packaged. It's nice. Uh, what else? Uh, uh, we know DHCP. Uh, yeah, there's a DHCP. Uh, Oh, uh, yeah, NF tables. Mm, I'm not so optimistic about that. Yeah, nothing for NF tables. Mm, so maybe that's something we can actually give back. There's an IP tables. Uh, which I'm going to guess is pretty similar to the way it was worked before. Uh, so... Uh, yes, install it, enable it. Uh, how you should react to particular services. So this would be a this would be a pillar that you would apply to different machines. Uh, there's NAT rules. So I mean, this general formula is probably the kind of thing we want to attempt. Uh, but. We want to be able to take these rules and do them by NF table. Uh, I mean, none of, none of this should be difficult. Uh, NF tables uh, is different in the way it you know it, you you don't tend to do. It piecemeal like this, uh, you can do single rules as large complex statements, and I think that's the way Salt by default tries to do it. But we can take this as a starting point and and say, well, okay, what can we do with this in terms of writing out NF tables rules? Uh, I think that's probably not a bad idea. Uh, Uh, but I mean, a lot of this you, uh, you know, we can use uh, again. It's translating it into IP tables. Uh, uh, salt modules, and there are NF table salt modules. So. Uh, it's translating them, uh, the pillar data into IP tables, which is this one. Uh, okay, so it's you know, but that's fairly easy because uh, of the structure of these things. Right? But if we look at NF tables. Uh, 
go. So I've got NF tables. Uh, yeah, it's pretty much the same stuff, isn't it? It might be really simple. It might be really simple. It might be a direct one for one. Probably worth, yeah, it's probably worth taking that as a start. Does it, does this also allow us to, I mean, we can check chain present. And it doesn't say anything about table. Inserting a rule into a chain, fine. Uh, very fine that a chain exists, but what about the table? This NF table specific module designed to manage Linux files. It's expected that this state module. Uh, yeah, yeah, okay, but. Yeah, given all all the years I've used salt, uh, this has been the promise that it will someday be sort of abstracted uh, to a sort of generic. But uh, uh, it's probably worth looking at the code behind this at some point and comparing it with the IP tables. Because there's nothing here talking about creating the tables. Well, NF tables doesn't doesn't create tables. Uh, you know, and this this could all be. Uh, uh, achieved with, you know, as you can see, it's basically the equivalent is IP tables. If we look at the execution modules. Uh, uh, we should have an IP table, yeah, IP table execution module. Uh, which really... Uh, um, the, the NF tables execution module. There we go. Uh, it looks very similar. Uh, ah, I see here we've got check table. Uh, and you've got delete. Uh, yeah. Yeah, so you've got delete table, uh, insert rule, uh, and again it's fairly simple because you actually specify the rule and yeah, it's basically just doing a text insert, isn't it? List tables, new new table. So so down at the module level, as you'd expect, you've got most of the facilities to do the, the low level construction. Uh, that checks the existence of each uh, new chain, new table, and then you've got the inserting of rules. Uh, so, so all of this stuff makes perfect sense. Um, But we'd have to look at the uh, NF tables state module. To 
see how we access things like table creation. It, it could be that it does it automatically, but it could also be that it assumes that you've already done it in some other way. Hmm. Right, that's something to do next time. Right, okay, enough already. Uh, I'll see you in the next one.